What a great week it's been to be a Flames fan. Between the wins against Edmonton and San Jose and the great games the Flames played against Anaheim, this team's really looking good. We'll talk about those games and we'll explore some of the young wingers in the Flames system. Plus, we're joined by former Flames captain Todd Simpson for an interview. All this and more coming right up. This is Fireside Chat episode 42, The Future of the Wingers. Recorded March 27th, 2014. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Welcome back to another episode of Fireside Chat with Dan and Matt. Matt, it's been an exciting week for Flames hockey. Have you been enjoying watching the team this week? I always enjoy good, hard-working efforts. That's really what we've had. I mean, this week started with the 8-1 win over the over the Oilers, which I think I was shocked about. Did you expect that kind of score? I was actually surprised because it was a fairly even game in, when it was 1-1. Then as soon as we scored to take the lead, like Edmonton just quit and they didn't resume playing at all. Yeah, I know. I was I was watching the I was watching the first part of the game. And, um, you know, we, we got down one nothing. I thought, oh, crap, Edmonton's going to roll over us. And then Geo scored the goal to tie it up. And then after that, the Flames just ran away with the game. Yeah. I've never seen a team quit to that extent before. Like, even bad teams. Like, I watch the Panthers quite frequently. And, like, they've never done anything like that. And they've been embarrassingly bad for, you know, since ever. Yeah, it was it was really surprising. I kept seeing the score go up, and you know we were getting up, you know three three to one, four to one, and I'm thinking, okay, this has got to end at some point. Like the Flames got to start to stop scoring goals. And when it was five one at the end of the second, I thought, okay, it's probably going to stay here. I did not expect it to get to eight one. Yeah, well, that four goal outburst in the second period was the second fastest that we've ever recorded four goals, and. The last time was against the Sharks in 93 when they were a fledgling expansion team. So, yeah, not good company there. No. But, you know, as a Flames fan, it was great fun to watch. Oh, yeah. It's always good to make fun of Edmonton. And speaking of the Sharks, you and I were at the game on Monday night where the Flames ended up losing uh, or won 2-1 to one over the Sharks. And you and I were both sitting there, and we were saying that we were really impressed by the Flames' effort in that one. I mean, they're one of the bottom teams in the league, and they were playing against one of the top teams in the league, and they really looked like they belonged on the ice with that team. Yeah, ever since, like, both the game against San Jose and the game against Anaheim, like, for large stretches of the periods, they looked like the better team, which is surprising considering looking at the standings where Anaheim and San Jose are and where we are. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's great to see the, the great effort from this team, and I hope we'll see it again tomorrow night against the Rangers. And, you know, it's weird. It's like this is supposed to be the worst year of the rebuild. This is supposed to be the year that hurts his Flames fans. And really, I found this year to be quite exciting and enjoyable for the most part as a Flames fan. Well, the thing is, is that Like, it's obvious that the Flames don't quite have enough talent on the team. But in every other aspect, they are performing as they need to. So, you know, there's nothing really to complain about. No. I think all we can do is go up from here. Yeah. Well, if we continue to get these kinds of efforts two and three and four years from now, then we'll become a dangerous team. Yeah, for sure. You and I talked uh, last week about the fact that the Flames had signed Brett Kulak, and we said that we were expecting Ryan Culkin's signing to come shortly after that because the two of them seemed to go very well together. And today I read that the Flames have indeed signed Ryan Kulak to a three-year entry-level deal. So no surprise there from our side. From what I've seen of each of them, they are virtually the same guy. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me that we got both of them under contract. And an interesting note as well is that uh, Michael Backlund is the 2014 Ralph T. Skurfeld Humanitarian Award winner this year for the team, and that's an award presented annually to a Flames player who best exemplifies perseverance, determination, and leadership on the ice, combined with dedication and community service off the ice. So I don't have the list of previous winners in front of me, but that sounds like a award that Jerome's probably been the winner of for a lot of years. Yeah, and, you know, Backlund's well-deserving of it. He is... 
vastly improved his overall game this year and you know good for him yeah no it's it's good to see he seems like not only on the ice but he's really become a presence off the ice you see him do more interviews talking to the media more even after the olympics when he had to wear the team canada shirt because of the bet that he lost he just seems like he's becoming more of a public face for this team which is really nice to see yeah so we got uh, upcoming games against the Rangers and the Senators, and that caps off the month of March. So hopefully the Flames can keep up their great uh, work in those two games. What are you expecting for outcomes on those two, Matt? Well, it, it is Eastern Conference teams, so I'd be a little surprised if the Flames walked away without four points in those two games. Yeah, and the way they're playing now, I think they could beat almost anybody, or at least you know come close to beating almost anybody. We do seem to be on quite a roll lately. And that's good to see. I know a lot of people said they wish the Flames would stop winning because they want to get a better draft pick. But to me, I'd rather see this team win and see this team put in a great effort than just, you know, pull the pull an Edmonton tank and get the number one pick. Well, additionally, in this draft, there's about seven or eight different guys that are would be good draft picks for us. It just depends on, like, what's available at the time. So, you know, there's not really too many worries on my end for where we're picking, as long as we're not, like, 10th overall or something like that. Well, the lottery can be your friend or your worst enemy in that case, too. True. I also think that we've probably had the most anticipated call-ups that we have in a couple years. I mean, often the Flames will make call-ups around the deadline or, you know, throughout the year because of injuries, and... I think, you know, this year people were excited. They were excited to see some of these call-ups, and there were names that the casual fan knew. So that's exciting to see, too, that, you know, these call-ups are anticipated guys coming up, not just, oh, it's a farm team guy because we have an injury. Yeah, not like the return of Jason Morgan from, like, 10 years ago. Or even Chris Kalanos a couple years ago. Oh, yeah, fun times. Yeah, and I know that online there was a lot of backlash whenever Street or uh, Jones got recalled because it was. It was, well, what's happening with the young guys? Why aren't we giving these guys a shot? Yeah, and it's understandable, but, you know, we also have to look at the fact that most of the guys that got called up after the trade deadline were in their first season in the AHL. And, you know, you can't rush guys, especially not, like, the prime guys, because, you know, they still have to work on their game quite a bit. Well, I think the fact that the Heat were in contention was probably a big part of it, too. They probably didn't want to take key pieces off the Heat roster because they want the AHL team to, you know, push for the Calder Cup. Yeah, because, like, say, like, Corbin Knight, he played well enough where he could have easily stayed, you know, at, without much difficulty, but he's vastly more important down there instead where he's going to be playing like a first or second line role instead of like 10 minutes up here yeah i mean you know sometimes you gotta call players up and that's what the team is there for but i think overall if you look at it, there's a lot of guys that and we talked about some of them last week and we'll talk about some of them as we go forward with other positions but guys that i probably would have called up earlier that i think they probably left down there um because they wanted them to play at the hl level and help the team yeah and, you know, with a lot of these players, like, it usually, unless, like, they're a top guy like Monaghan, it usually takes two or three seasons for them to figure things out properly and then, like, establish themselves as NHLers. And with most of our young guys, they are, like, in our, their first seasons in the AHL. So, you know, it, we all have to be a little patient. Yeah, you're right. It's probably better to have a guy like Ben Street come up and play on a fourth line for, you know, a quick road swing than it would be to bring up some of our hotly anticipated prospects like Ben Hanowski and guys like that who are probably going to get better minutes, better quality minutes, and more minutes staying in the AHL. And to help us out with this, we actually have a special guest tonight. We have the webmaster of the Heat Hockey Headquarters website who's joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. You probably have a knowledge of some of these younger guys better than Matt and I do as you've watched them all year long. We've caught a couple games with them. So hopefully you can give us some insights and help introduce some of the fans to some of these young players. 
Yeah, it's a pretty fortunate year for the Abbotsford Heat. It's uh, definitely the most talented roster we've ever seen them put together. Now, I know as Flames fans, we know that that roster pretty much got decimated after the trade deadline, and we made a bunch of call-ups, and they went on a big uh, losing streak there. Do the Heat still have playoff hopes at this point? Yeah, uh, surprisingly, they banked enough points in the early season. They had a stretch where they won, I believe, 13 out of 14 and uh, that sort of mitigated the losing streak that came after the trade deadline with all the call-ups and the rotating roster. So they're still sitting in a playoff spot where they land at this point. Could be uh, as high as fourth or as low as eighth, but they do look like they're a lock for the AHL playoffs. People for years said the Flames' cupboards are bare, and I think if we look at where the Heat are at and the fact that they are doing so well, I think we can all agree that the cupboards are probably not as bare as a lot of people said they were. I think uh, just based on how many rookies were able to step into the Flames team this year, even on limited ice time, if you uh, look at the numbers, you'll you'll see that there's more options this year than there has been in any uh, year in recent memory. I mean, we don't have, you know, number maybe number one centerman, number two centerman that are, you know, two, three years away, but... Um, I think we've definitely got some some guys who, you know, are going to make the NHL here. Even this season, you have Ben Street and Blair Jones as two older guys, 27 years old. Not that exciting for Flames fans thinking about the future to see those two guys come in for a call-up. Both very skilled guys, but for fans thinking, okay, we are going to be competitive and three years, four years minimum, a guy like Ben Street coming up and taking away a bit of that rookie ice time can be frustrating for for people. So last week we started to profile some of the young flames in the system, and we started with the defensemen. And tonight we figured that we talked about some of the wingers on this team. Well, let's, uh, let's start looking at some of these wingers, and I think a guy who probably falls well into this uh, discussion of development is Sven Berchi. First round pick, 13th overall by the Flames in 2011. He's been up and down between Calgary and the AHL since then. I mean, he's you know he his first year he played most of his time with the Heat. Uh, this season he played 26 games with the Flames, getting only 11 points. And then he was sent down to Abbotsford where he played 33 games and got 19 points. I didn't get a lot of chance to see him in Abbotsford, but I know there's some mixed feelings with Berchi here. My thoughts on him is that he's going to be an NHL guy. He just needs some more time to figure out his game. Oh, yeah. I, like, I actually think he might get called up towards the end of the season just to, you know, get back another couple games at the end. But, you know, it, with players like Berchi, you know, like most players have to go to the AHL to figure some things out. And, you know, it... Everybody would wish that you could just, you know, fast forward through this part, but, you know, like, you look at Nazim Kadri with Toronto, like, he kept going up and down their roster until he figured it out, and with Berchi, I feel that it's much the same kind of thing. Yeah, and I mean, once he got sent down, he never did get called back up, and I expected at some point they'd call him back up as a as an injury replacement, but... I, I think that's probably good for his development. Ward seems like a great development coach. Um, you know, if he does need to learn how to be a professional, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but this was, if I remember, one of Brian Burke's first moves after he took over. So who knows, it's just a personality clash, but Sven Berchi, probably a guy that we all think will see the light of day here with the Flames again, wearing a flaming C at some point, and probably a good piece both for the Flames and um, right now for the Heat. But what about the next guy on our list, which is a little bit of a wild card, probably a guy a lot of fans don't know about, uh, and that's David Eddy. He's a right winger, um, five foot eleven, one hundred ninety pounds. He only played five games with the Heat this year, and then he was banished to the ECHL, which is generally not a good sign. What do we think about David Eddy? Uh, he was a bit of a hard worker from the limited viewings I saw of him, but. He didn't really have any skill that would make him an NHL player. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking too. And, you know, at that level, these guys are a dime a dozen too. I mean, the Flames could easily find a replacement for him without looking that hard at all. Yeah. 
And, like, really the wing is the flame's best position, depth-wise. So, you know, it's, you pretty much have to be looking like a top six caliber NHL player to overcome the amount of depth we have. No, for sure. So next guy we'll look at then, hopefully a guy who has a little bit more future, but also a guy who has a little bit of a concern because he was banished to the Alaska Aces partway through the year is Turner Elson. Uh, List is a left winger. He's 5'11", 180, so another small guy. He's going to be in tough to be a full-time NHLer with the Calgary Flames because I think there's too many guys ahead of him in the depth chart. But I still think he will be an NHL player. So, like, either the Flames would have to trade off several other people down the road for him to get a shot here, or he might be included in a trade. But, you know, he does look like an NHL player, in my opinion. Yeah, he had 57 points in 64 games that year, so still a fairly productive player. Why don't we move on to perhaps one of, if not the most... I guess, talked about Flames prospects. I think this is one that we can all think that the Flames got a heck of a pick on, and that's Johnny Gaudreau. This was a guy that uh, we know that Feaster was high on. He loved this kid. Uh, We all know that Feaster is high on the U.S. uh, hockey league, well, the U.S. college league and the U.S. high school league. He's picked guys from there. Gaudreau was drafted fourth round, 104th overall in 2011. And, I mean, this is a guy that's played a fantastic college career. He's had at least a point a game every year for Boston. Um, This year he's played 37 games at 69 points. His only downside that a lot of people say is he's 5'7 and weighs 150 pounds. Do you guys think that will keep him out of the NHL? No. I think, like, back when I saw him live in July, he looked like an NHL all-star at the junior tournament. And, you know... He has that level of ability where, you know, it's not like he's going to hit everything that moves. That's not his style. So, you know, he's there to be evasive and put the puck in the net. And if a guy like, say, Mike Camilleri can be successful, then I don't see why Gaudreau couldn't be as well. I think, too, as Flames fans, I think people will rally behind John and Gaudreau because they will hearken back to the days of, the other small player for the Flames before Camilleri, which was Theron Fleury, a guy that a lot of people didn't think would get a chance and ended up being a huge star here. So I think that there's going to be some nostalgic feelings that are brought up with Gaudreau when he eventually makes it here. But, yeah, if Theo can do it, if Cammy can do it, I see no reason this kid can. He obviously shows he can play hockey. I mean, you know, 69 points in 37 games, no matter what league you're in, that's a great total. Yeah, and... Like, just for a comparable with Monaghan at that development camp, like, he was the second best player there, and Gaudreau was on, like, a completely different planet from Monaghan. That's how good he was. So you're saying Gaudreau was better than Monaghan? Well, in terms of pure offensive ability, he definitely was at that development camp. Okay. For people that have said that, you know, Jay Feaster wasn't great at drafting, didn't, you know, really do a good job here, I would point you to John Gaudreau. I mean, he's a fourth-round pick. To be able to find a guy like this in the fourth round and take him, I think it shows that Feaster was, you know, he he had a lot of things that we could argue he didn't do well, but I think drafting is one thing that he did better than the guy before him, Sutter. And when you can take a guy like this in the fourth round and have so many fans excited about him, I think it shows that, you know, he had a good eye for talent. Yeah. And, like, especially when you look at that whole draft, like, our our five picks were Berchi, Grandlin, Waterspoon, Goudreau, and Brossois. And, you know, the four top guys are all looking really good, and Brossois was used to get Ladislav Schmid, so that, that definitely lends some credence to the Flames drafting abilities at that time. Yeah, and, you know, I think that Bersois, he is, I mean, all these guys are assets, and if you can't make it, yeah, let's trade him away and get an experienced defenseman. Why not? If you look at one team that won the draft from top to bottom, it was Calgary. 
I think you have to credit uh, the staff under Feaster. Feaster had always said he was a groupthink kind of guy, and I think after Sutter left, the, the scouts were finally allowed to do what they do best, and that's pick the best players in the draft without Sutter looking for an Alberta hometown boy or a guy who's 6'2 plus, or, you know, there were kind of rules to Sutter's draft that didn't apply to Jay Feaster's draft, and that's why we got a lot more... Uh, smaller skilled players in those few years. Uh, this year it'll be interesting with Brian Burke at the helm, whether he uh, whether he has a new GM in for the draft, whether he lets that same scouting group that's drafted these last three years and I think done a really good job if he lets them continue to make the picks. It'll be really interesting to see, you know, this is a new era, what kind of, what kind of prospects are our next group of prospects because right now you could basically qualify this group as uh, being dominated by the college ranks, being dominated by skill over size, and uh, it's changed dramatically uh, every time the regime changes, for sure. Let's move on to the next winger on our list. This is a guy that, it's funny, we were just talking about the Sutter mold. This is a guy that when he was picked, seemed to me like he would have been a Daryl Sutter type player, and that's Coda Gordon. He's a left winger from Cochrane, six foot, 181 pounds. Um, he's been better than a point per game this year with the Swift Current Broncos. I've seen this guy play at the WHL level, and I really like watching him. He's a player that I like to watch play hockey. He's one of those players that does things well, but not anything overly exceptional. And he might be a little underrated because of that because he does do a lot of things very good it's just there's no flash to his game but i think he's the kind of guy who i mean he's a sixth round pick so obviously a lot of gms think that there's not a lot of flash to him but i think he's the kind of guy you would see as a second or third line guy a guy you can put in night after night and know that he can adapt to pretty much whatever he needs to adapt to to get the job done basically like when i first saw him play like the the mold of player that jumped out at me was Matt Stajan, but like, you know, the prospect version. Just someone that's there and like can shift between lines and not, you know, look out of place. See, he to me reminds me of a slower version of uh, Matthew Lombardi. I think he's got some offensive upside, but I don't think that he's going to have staying power as a long term you know, centerpiece of any team, but I think he's going to be a guy like Lombardi who is moving around maybe every couple of years because teams see him as a piece that they want on their roster to fill out the bottom bottom six. Yeah, it's quite possible. It's one of those that we won't really be able to tell for another couple of seasons. Yeah, well, and, and Coda Gordon is still a young guy. I mean, he's still 19. So uh, because he's a sixth-round pick, I'm not expecting him to – for us to know what we've got yet. That's part of what you're getting when you're you know drafting the sixth round is these guys need time to open up. Part of the intrigue with uh, Coda Gordon is is will he – will they sign him? He's sort of the last of – of that 2012 group to be signed. And I think that they need to uh, sign him fairly soon before he re-enters the draft. That's true. But, you know, if you're getting rid of a guy like David Eddy, I don't see why you couldn't get Coda to replace him. Well, I would have him signed already. There's no there's no contract pressure. We've got lots of contracts. So I'm curious to know what the holdup is if they're trying to use uh, – the contract is motivation here in the last part of the junior season or or what exactly the strategy is. I do expect Brian Burke, uh, as he has done, to make all the obvious moves and retain an asset, uh, you know, that could always be moved for another yeah. pick, if nothing else. Burke's not one to let go of an asset. Yeah, that's one thing that I've found with him is he's very diligent in making, getting full value for assets. Yeah, a lot of conditional picks, a lot of interesting things that he does to make sure that he's getting value for every asset he's got. Well, I think that's why we didn't see Camilleri traded at the deadline. Is uh, He's very demanding of value for assets. He sure is. Well, this is another guy I'm not 100% sure about, but Matt, I know you know a lot about him. Another sixth-round pick from the Flames in 2013. He was drafted 157th overall, and that's Tim Harrison, who's currently playing uh, in college as well. Yeah, he's a six foot three guy, and he's very quick for his size. And 
one of the things that was notable about him in July was, like, he hit Sven Berchi and actually got Berchi to kind of retaliate and cross-check him in the face. So, you know, if he brings that kind of smash-mouth, you know, in-your-face thing to get under the opposing player's skin, then I could easily see him becoming an NHLer, even though it'll be a, as, like, a fourth-line banger type. More or less like another Lance Boma, give or take. And I mean, Boma ended up securing an NHL spot this year, so there's no reason that Harrison couldn't if he's a similar... Yeah, and the the one thing that sets him apart from most depth guys is he's actually very fast for his size. So, like, that's a added asset there, because... You know, you don't need to worry as much about him getting out of the play if he does deliver a big hit. Well, either way, it sounds like more of a physical player than an offensive threat, but as we all know, you need those guys. And in a Brian Burke type system, a six foot three guy who can be that physical player probably has a, a future in the organization. Maybe not on the Flames top 18, but, you know, somewhere within the organization. Yeah, and. His slap shot and wrist shot alone would make him an NHLer just because he gets the puck off his stick that quick. You know, and the rest of his game, there's plenty of like there as well. So, yeah, I like the pick a lot. I think there's enough interesting about Tim Harrison that even if he doesn't make it here, there might be other teams that'd be interested in giving him a shot. He's just like, you know, he's big, he's fast. If he doesn't make it with the Flames, I think that we could turn him into some sort of usable asset. Moving on, this is the first of the three guys we'll be talking about tonight who came over as part of the Jerome McGinley deal. And this is the guy that we actually drafted with the draft pick that we got back from Boston. Round 1, 28th overall in 2013, and that's Morgan Klimchuk, a left winger, 5'11", 185 pounds, from Calgary. So a local boy. Um, Again, a player I've seen play in Regina this year. I like watching Klimchuk play. He's dynamic. He's fun. It was a good pick based on where the Flames were picking with that. I don't think, and I think the biggest pressure he's going to have is he's the guy that we picked in the Jerome McGinley trade, and I think he's going to have to get that out of his head and realize that he just has to play his game. He can't let that get to him and kind of create his own career here, not forever be in the shadow of the guy we got rid of to get him. Yeah, I think I think for fans too, he, I, I think the statistic is about 15% of people drafted outside of the top 10, 15% of skaters make uh, make it on to NHL careers. So we have to be uh, pretty realistic that, you know, we made three draft picks in the first round and they're all looking good right now. But statistically, that's still against us that uh, Klimchuk is going to become uh, an NHLer. But when you look who, who was drafted around him, he certainly seems to be on paper, uh, performing pretty well. I think one of the the benefits Klimchuk will have, and same with Poirier, who we'll talk about next, is that they will be ready to join this team still during the rebuild, I think. So they may get a chance there, just because we might still be short on depth. We're a team that is a playoff contender, a team like a Detroit or something like that. They might not get the same kind of look. You could be right. The development is definitely going to be a little slower for these guys. You can think about Joel Colburn. He he was an original first round draft pick and it took him a long time to get his game together. I mean, this is the first year for him, and he's he's getting on in in his young age. So good to have patience with these guys with the low first round picks, but. This is definitely the the area of the draft in that low first round and that second round where there's still lots of good diamonds in the rough, lots of players that are going to be impact players that are going to make a difference for a team. For sure. And the other guy we got in that uh, same first round, it was Klimchuk, Monahan, who's already made the team, and the pick that we got back in the Jay Bowmeister deal was Emil Poirier, who's another left winger. Uh, 19 years old, playing in the QMJHL for Gatineau. And he's put up a, a ton of points usually. Um, I haven't got to see Poirier as much as I'd like to. Are either of you guys that familiar with him? Uh, yes, and he's got the same speed as Matthew Lombardi. And, you know, he, his hands, though, are a lot better. And, like, 
one of Lombardi's faults was that he couldn't release the candle when he was on his tears. But, like, Poirier can deke out people and, like, snap that top corner in tight. So, you know, it, he looks good. Plus, he's 6'2", and, you know, like, for wanting to get bigger, like, he's got that aspect to his game as well. If you had to pick one guy, Matt, if you could only sign one of them, Klimchuk or Poirier, based on what you're seeing now, which one would you think would go further with an NHL career? Uh, honestly, outside of Goudreau, I think Poirier is the top player in our organization for forwards. So I would definitely... Go- Do you think Poirier is above Monaghan well, even? Not in the NHL. So Monaghan's... Yeah, okay. that's a whole different thing. But for... Okay, but you're talking about guys not in yeah. the NHL. So other than Goudreau, skill-wise, okay. and like the whole package, Poirier would be next on my list. Yeah, some of the uh, highlight, some of the highlight reels you see of uh, Poirier, that four-goal game of his, it, he looks like he's just got it all. He's exciting in the same way that uh, Johnny Goudreau is exciting, and uh, it'll be interesting when he's over in the West and closer, and where we're able to keep a better eye on him because. You know, the li- the viewings are so limited right now. Yeah, I've only seen stuff on YouTube, you know, highlight reels and stuff, and I hate to make judgments based on those, but I'd really like to get him um, over, like you said, over the West, playing some pro hockey um, so we can evaluate him a bit better. So why don't we uh, chat for a bit about one of the newest Flames, perhaps one of the most anticipated Flames. I can't remember the last guy who debuted with this team um, as a rookie that wasn't Monaghan, who's had as much talk as Kenny Agostino has. They brought him over from Yale this year. Um, there was probably a week's worth of talk as to um, you know, is, when he was ready to come, when he was going to play, how he was going to look, that sort of thing. And there's another guy that was brought over as part of the Jerome McGinley deal. He was drafted fifth overall by the Penguins and traded here. Um, so far from what we've seen as a pro, I'm really liking what we see as Kenny, Kenny Agostino. He's not been all that visible. He hasn't, you know, really stood out yet, but you can tell watching him. And when we were there live, uh, Matt and I to watch the Sharks game, you could tell that he was getting his NHL legs under him and he wasn't making any big mistakes. So I think he's going to take some time to adjust to the game, but I'm liking what I see so far. And if he can... turn into a solid third line presence then you know that's a very useful piece and you know i'd have no real critiques on his game you know you'd wish that he'd have a little more offense because he has a lot of the other things that you like in a player but you know i definitely have no problem with seeing him i think he's going to turn into more of a two-way or defensive forward than he's going to be a big offensive threat on this team yeah, I think the next year is going to determine a lot for Kenny Agostino. He was a big shooter in Yale, shot the puck all the time, uh, looked at to kind of create that north-south offense. So we'll see what happens. I expect him to get a full season uh, with the Abbotsford Heat next year. So uh, I don't think he's eligible to play in the playoffs with the Heat this year just based on how contracts work and trade deadlines. So uh, we won't get a chance to see him here this spring. I won't be able to do any reporting on him. But I do suspect next year, uh, even in the rebuild, it's going to be best for Kenny, best for the Flames, if he does take a year in the AHL just to get that pro game uh, developed. Yeah, you can tell there's definitely stuff he needs to work on, and that's the best way to work on it. I think this is for the Flames right now to evaluate him and see where he's at and you know, know what they've gotten him. And yeah, I think it, I would be very shocked if he did not end up on the HL roster at the beginning of next year. Yeah. And, you know, especially with the late season call ups like last year with Hanowski, it gives the player some time to see, oh, this is how good it is up here. And to evaluate both the player and, you know, the coaching evaluating the player. To see like what does it, that player need to address and you know it's always good like well, I think a lot of that's trainers too of working with the trainers and figuring out what he needs to work on in the off season. oh definitely and the player that he reminds me quite a bit of is David Moss and you know he's a little bit slower 
Yeah. Yeah, uh, like very intelligent in terms of knowing where to be in the offensive zone, but you know it, that it just takes time. Like I think Moss was twenty five or twenty six by the time he came into the NHL full time, so you know it's one of those things that you have to be a little patient with. But you know if you're looking at him being that kind of like depth scorer guy, I could see that. But it, you know might not even be next year but the year after yeah and you know that's what you want again you want a team that's really developing these young guys because they're not going to get any better to help us out becoming a better team in the future if we're not really pushing them that way it's off the ice stuff too it's the nutrition it's the workouts all those sort of things Let's talk a little bit about Hanaski since you brought him up. The third piece that came over in the Jerome deal, he was raid, he was drafted in round three by the Penguins in 20, 2009. He's 23 years old. Um, he came over pretty much right away from Cloud State. As soon as the Flames acquired him, they signed him, and he played five games at the end of last year. He got one goal in those games, which I remember we all thought was pretty special. And this year he's played eight games so far, and he's got uh, no goals but two points. I'm liking what I see of him at this level, but how's he looked for the Heat so far this year? Well, it gives me the perfect time to talk about something that's happened to a lot of Heat players, and that's uh, hitting the college wall. And uh, if you look at a college season, it's about uh, 40, 45 games maximum. You know, they don't play very big seasons, very long seasons there. They only play on the weekends. Ben Hanowski, he started the season incredibly strong. He had 21 points in his first 28 games, had a five-game point streak or two tucked in there, I'm pretty sure, and he played incredibly well to start the year. He's got good size, he's got good hockey IQ, but around that 40-game mark, he hit the same wall that a lot of other rookie college players uh, hit this year, where suddenly the the legs just aren't there anymore, and I think it's something that a lot of uh, heat players are having to deal with. It co- corresponded almost perfectly with our losing record, was uh, this about the same time of year that the college season would wrap up, you know. So it's it's made it's been a struggle for a lot of players. Ben Hanowski has not been immune to that, but he's showing everything else that you want to see in a prospect. You got to treat him like a rookie still, even though he was around the organization last year. This is legitimately his rookie professional season. So try not to get the expectations too high, but this is a player who's uh he's got a lot of promise and uh you know, I think if he's not in the NHL next year. By 25, he should be a he should be a guy that we can look to on the fourth line, on the third line, as a high IQ, big body type of player. So we're, we've got only a couple guys left on our list. Then um, another guy who listed as a centerman has been playing wing most of the year, and that's Max Reinhardt. This was one of the I believe the last Daryl Sutter picks. He was in the third round, 64th overall in 2010. So he's an older guy. He's 22. And he's had a pretty good uh, run. He had a pretty good run in the AHL. He's had a decent run this year, I think, in the Heat. How's he looked in the AHL so far this year, playing out of position? Well, you're going to see that with a lot of uh, prospects. They're all listed as centers to start, but there's not that many positions to go around and what what we're seeing on the heat is there's not a forward line that doesn't have two centermen on it so uh, there's lots of versatility happening it's gonna be really good should a player come into a position like Joel Colburn came into where they're asked to move over off the center to the wing it's gonna help them make that transition because it's something that's uh, happening all the time in Abbotsford and the best thing about Reinhardt is he's on the way up this year compared to last year and how he's embraced the game and being a professional, if we see anything even close to the same amount of development, then we've got an NHLer on our hands. I think he's got enough looks and enough talk by the brass here that we know that they like and we know that they're looking at him. So yeah, I think that's pretty safe to say that he's going to be at least given every opportunity to win a job here that they could possibly yeah. give them. Next season, I definitely see Reinhardt starting the year in Calgary. And, like, I think he's taken enough steps forward in his game that, like, you could pencil him into the fourth line wing spot and, you know, see where he goes from there. And, you know, you said he's a very different player between this year and last year. What do you think 
twigged in his mind? Was it just having to adjust to the uh, pro game? Was it something that Ward and his staff did to help this guy succeed? Do we know what it was that just turned his game around? I think uh, I think there's probably three things that you could uh, narrow it down to having the biggest impact on changing Max Reinhardt. Uh, one is just being a year older and being on a team that's relying on young players. That's something that Abbotsford hasn't had to do in the past. We've always got a few veterans stocked away, and uh, you know we try and re rely on the veterans. Well, this year it was up to the young kids, and he really embraced that role. I think that was a major change for him. Moving off the center ice position and having Granlin as a centerman, it just it turned on his offensive game. Suddenly he's making tic-tac-toe passes. He has a finisher. He has somebody that he can trust is going to back him up if he goes into the corner. Um, that confidence has, has translated all season long, even when Granlin hasn't been around. Once he started playing with him, it kind of opened up this, oh, I, I'm a better player than I realized. And then even after Granlin left, it, it hasn't phased him at all. So those are two major things. And then the last thing is, it's a deeper team this year, and if you're not, if you're not gonna be the go-to guy, so let's go to the last guy. Uh, on our find list. another else. guy that I don't know a whole lot about. Um, I'll rely on you guys. I think you saw this guy in in um, training camp, Matt, and that's Josh Juris, a fl player the Flames never drafted. He was signed as a UFA, I believe he's a walk-on UFA, and never played at the NHL level. But he is 23. He's six foot, 190. What do you guys think of Josh Juris? Well, he's skilled, uh, but I don't think he's got, like, high-end skill. You know, like, in the college ranks, he did get, like, 30 points in each of his last two seasons, I do believe. And So, like, he's not completely untalented, and he was the best of the walk-ons, but I don't know if he has NHL upside. Like, the player, when I first saw him that he reminded me of was Ben Street and I think he's that kind of guy that he's not quite good enough for the NHL but not you know can be a leading scorer in the AHL okay he's not I mean he's not showing that he's a leading scorer right now he's played 63 games this year 24 points um seems like he's he's got 40 penalty minutes so probably more of a grinder but uh what is our heat expert from heat hockey headquarters think of him well i really like josh juris uh it's funny uh, out of the training camp i kind of had him pegged as my dark horse like you know he scored a couple of goals in that development camp and and i he he caught my attention i started to wonder what kind of player we picked up here uh it's a pretty cool story him in abbotsford he's living in a house with knight and hanowski these three college uh roommates and they're really good for the team. There's a lot of uh, chemistry. They've even all played on a line together at certain times this year. Uh, Juris isn't afraid to shoot the puck. You know, he's playing on a line with Sven Berchi some of the years. So he gets put with the skilled guys because he does have some finish. He's managed to score 10 goals, which is a should be considered an, a success for any rookie pro to get uh, 10 professional goals in your first season. You know, he's he's like the opposite of David Eddy to me, where they looked at a guy out of college that they thought maybe could could make a difference at the professional rank, and Josh has really done that. He's going to be a big part of the Heat next year. He's not an RFA until 2015, and even then he's an RFA, so we've got some time. Josh Juris is going to be a part of the Flames organization for at least the next uh, two or three years. Whether or not he... Uh, he becomes anything more than like a Brett Olson player who's sort of a, you know, a medium scorer on the heat who trying to get a contract but uh, may not get one. Whether he's that kind of player or not, we'll see. But uh, I like him a lot more than some of these uh, walk-on uh, signings that we've done in the past. And, you know, we've talked about that. Of We can't have every player in our organization a potential NHL. -er. There have to be guys, especially when you want your AHL team to be competitive, who are going to be, for all intents and purposes, AHL players. You know, they might be lucky to get a call-up if somebody's hurt, but we need guys like that. And from what I've seen of Juris, I don't know if he has an NHL future, but I think he probably has a future as a long-time Heat uh, player if the Flames want him there. 
Yeah, well, like, one of the things that you need to develop your players properly is having players that, like, if you make a pass, they can receive it and, like, complete the play. Like, we're seeing, like, with Mark Jankowski, like, his line mates are not good at all. And, like, if you've seen any of his games, like, he'll have passes that are great. It's just that the play dies right there because the line mate's not very good. So having someone like Joris who can receive the pass and make the play or pass it to you, like, that'll help the player develop as well because then they can be more creative for sure and you know he is an older guy he he's been around been, been around for longer than some of these guys in pro hockey um both with you know college and ahl he's what 23 i think juris so yeah. he could he could be what Still considered a rookie, but one of those guys that as we start pulling guys up from the Canadian Hockey League and college, he might be looked at as more of a leader at the AHL level as well. Yeah, it's very possible. I think he's definitely on the slow road. They've got him on the on the back burner, and they're just going to let him slowly develop in Abbotsford, and we'll see what happens. I don't think anybody should run out and buy a Josh Juris Flames jersey because it's not going to happen this year, it's not going to happen next year, or the year after. But he'll be around for a bit, and whether he develops into a player that can get an NHL contract, another one, or whether he has to go to the Europe to kind of, if that ends up being his skill ceiling, that's something that, uh, you know, we'll we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and, you know, even if he does get ready to chase that next big deal and there's value there, I mean, if he is going to be a career AHL guy, maybe in a year or two, somebody else sees him, says, oh, we want him in our organization. Let's flip him, get a pick or a prospect, and try to build the next Josh Juris. Pretty impressive uh, pretty impressive guy at the AHL level, though. A guy that, uh, as uh, other people have hit that, that college wall at 40 games, you know, he's, he's pushed through that, and he's been, a, he's been a good player here, even in the spring when all the call-ups happen. So, great depth guy to have in the organization. Don't want to knock his game at all. It's not an NHL game. It may never be one, but he's the guy. You need you need that pressure from the bottom. You need guys to fill those roles when guys go up on call-ups. He's, he's the kind of guy you want to have around, but a guy that's hard to keep. You know, They want to keep pursuing their NHL dreams. If for the franchise, it would be best to just keep this guy as a depth AHLer. So you get him while they're under contract, and, and then you know you got to find someone new when they when they go and chase that next big deal. For sure, and especially because he was a walk-on. He was essentially an undrafted player. The more of those you can find, you know, the better you're going to be. If you can be getting guys who have a, a solid pro career, both through the draft and undrafted, that tells you you've got a, a pretty good scouting department. Yeah, he's way closer to being an asset than David Eddy, who, who we won't be able to get an, even a seventh-round pick from. So even... Even that alone says that the scouting has improved. Well, we I think that's probably it for the wingers this week. Um, pretty dynamic group, and based on the three of us, it sounds like we've got some pretty good prospects here as far as guys who are probably going to be um, top-level guys like Emil Poirier, maybe a Klimchuk, guys who will probably have an NHL career like a Ben Hanowski, Max Reinhardt, Sven Berchi, and then we've got some bottom-of-the-barrel guys like David Eddy too, so... When I look at this list and I think about the Flames and their rebuild, I'm not too concerned. Are either of you guys concerned about what we're seeing here? Oh, no. And realistically, we're still in the first year, so we'll be getting even more high-end guys in there in the next year or two. So, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, I, I can tell you from a, an Abbotsford Heat perspective, it's the best group we've had in five years. So whether that means uh, that they all translate to higher ceiling than guys in the past, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean for for us here in Abbotsford, we've uh, we've been entertained thoroughly having guys like Yoni Ordio and Marcus Granlin and the resurgence of Max Reinhardt. It's really, really excellent. Um, definitely exciting for those diehard Flames fans here in BC that we get to we get to see the rebuild in action before you guys do if our listeners want to know more about the heat where can they go to find your work uh 
definitely give us a follow on Twitter uh, at Heat Hockey HQ. Give us a follow on uh, Twitter for sure. We'd really appreciate that. That way you can see all our articles as they come out. Right now we're posting our articles on heathockey.wordpress.com and uh, it's all kind of a as it comes up and there's lots of insight that's not uh, not necessarily game day but more based on prospect profiles. If anybody uh, wants to get a better idea of what's going on in Abbotsford, you can always uh, send me a message on Twitter or uh, check out our website. We've always got stuff coming out for uh, Hungry Flames and Heat fans. And this has been my go-to site this year for Heat news, trying to follow the team. I have a hard enough time trying to follow the Flames um, all year, much less follow the Heat too. So your site's been great in helping us with that, and we hope that we'll get you on uh, some more this year. Great, yeah, I would love to be back. Uh, go Flames, go go Heat, go. We're looking forward to uh, having a longer play, uh, having a longer hockey season here with playoffs coming up. We should have a really healthy roster. And uh, for Flames fans, if you've ever thought about watching the Heat, this is the time to watch them. They got great skill. They've got exciting hockey. You've got a future NHLer in net with Yoni Ordio. So uh, check them out. Check out my site. Just keep the uh, Keep the hype up for the team. It's a, it's a great team, and they deserve all the uh, attention they can get. Well, with that, uh, Matt and I want to make an announcement that me, myself and Matt, our Fireside Chat team, are going to be helping out the Pro-Am Hockey Tournament coming up on April 4th and 5th. Uh, there's a great charity tournament. Actually, sorry, 4th, 5th, and 6th will be there. And we're actually going to be doing play-by-play -play for their two um, All-Star Games and their championship games. So if anyone's looking to have some fun, you should come out to Winsport. Um, it's going to be NHL veterans. It's going to be you know players from all over Calgary at all different skill levels, all playing together and having some fun. So Matt and I are looking forward to that. And if you come out and you're uh, a Fireside Chat fan, come see us when we're not calling the games there. And if you do want to listen to us call the games, um, you can do so at firesidechat.ca, our website, and you'll see a link right on the homepage to where we'll be calling those games. So, so we hope to see some Fireside Chat fans either out at the rink at Winsport or... Um, listening online and again to get more information on the tournament just visit our site and you'll see a link there but before we sign off tonight we can't forget that we have a great interview with a former flames captain todd simpson and he was uh kind enough to join me for an interview a couple weeks ago so let's head to the captain shall we this is dan stevenson with fireside chat and i'm here alongside former flames captain todd simpson how you doing today todd doing well how are you doing dan not too bad. The Mercury hit minus 30 here in Calgary today, so I imagine it's much nicer there in Kelowna. Yeah, we're at plus three today, and I think it's going to get a little warmer, so it's uh, not too hard to take. I don't miss that minus 30 stuff. Yeah, I envy where you are. I, I can't do the minus 30. Oh, you're, you're doing it. You'll, you'll survive. Oh, I know we will. We'll just complain about it every step of the way. <laughs> uh, it's a great city. I do miss Calgary. So, Todd, do you, uh, do you still watch much Flames hockey? Yeah, I catch the odd game here and there. And um, are you involved in hockey at all still in Kelowna? Um, I coach both, both my kids are playing. There's uh, one's an Adam and one's a Peewee, so I, I coach both of them. So we're, uh, we're at the rink most nights for sure. And uh, I still manage to get a, sort of a skate in myself once a week every Thursday. Nice. And what's it like coaching hockey at that level after being involved for most of your adult life with hockey at a professional level? Well, it's a, it's a huge difference. Um, you know, it's, it's a great experience. It's really rewarding. You just want the kids to, you know, enjoy and improve every year. And, you know, I kind of measure my success as a coach as if uh, everyone signs up for, uh, for another year of hockey next year. You just want to keep as many kids in as possible. Yeah, I imagine it's much easier to tell the kids, trust me, I know it's good for you, and you've played at the professional level. Uh, it's a little easier. It's easier with some of the kids. My own kids don't listen to me at all, though. They don't think I have a clue that I know what I'm talking about at all, so it's kind of funny. That's always true of your own kids, though, right? Yeah, I guess so. I don't know, it's funny. So you started your professional hockey career here with the Flames. You signed with them as an undrafted free agent in 1994. 94 is when I signed with Calgary. That was my first first contract. Yeah, it's been uh, 20 years now. Yeah, it's amazing how time flies. And you became captain of the Flames in 1997. And I believe at the time you were the youngest captain in, in franchise history and still are. Um, 
What was it like being named captain at such a young age? Were you expecting it when they named you captain? No, I know I wasn't expecting it at all. Uh, I'd only played a season there. Uh, you know, I'd been in the minors a couple of years, and and uh, we were just sort of going through a bit of a transition period. We'd, we'd lost a lot of the, the veterans, and and we started the season without a captain. And yeah, you know, I didn't really think about it at all. I was just you know playing hard and playing the way I played, and and then one day Brian Sutter came to me and said, "Hey, you're going to be our our next captain." So it was uh, it was one of those great great shocks and great surprises. So it was the coach's decision then. It wasn't necessarily the guys in the room. It was from upstairs. As far as I know, I think it is Brian Sutter. Whether he talked to some of the other guys or not, I, I don't know. But it wasn't like we all sat around and had a vote or anything like that. Okay. And, you know, there's a lot of people that um, I don't know if they really understand what it means to be a captain at the NHL level. What are some of the pressures or commitments that go along with wearing that C that we might not know about as the average fan? Well, I can tell you, after every game you lose, all the media comes and talks to the captain. So that's that's kind of a crappy part. And then when you win, they go and talk to the guys that scored the goal or the goalie that played great. So it just felt like I was the guy that got all the bad news or bad interviews and had to talk about, you know, what was wrong. And back in those days, um, you know, we didn't do a whole lot of winning. I, You know, we were sort of in the fight to make the playoffs, but we uh, we ended up losing out in the last, you know, two, three, four weeks, it seemed like, for those seasons. So we were really scrapping and fighting by just to, to hang in there. You know, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, the way that you guys were trying to hang in there. And really, if you look at that, that's reminiscent to where the Flames are right now. I mean, they're going through a rebuild. They've admitted it's a rebuild. Back then during the Young Guns era, as they called it, it was very similar. A lot of young guys, a lot of guys trying to, you know, stake their claim and, uh, get their career started. What advice would you have for a player who's on the current roster in sort of a similar scenario that you could pass on as someone who's been through that? It's really tough when you're right in the middle of it. You know, I think you just have to stay positive. You got to work as hard as you possibly can. Uh, you got to believe in the guys in the room, and you know that good things are going to happen. I think that's the best way to help your team, and that's the best way to help your own own career is just uh, stay committed, stay positive. And, uh, you know, really try to believe, even though uh, a lot of the odds are against you. The Flames have a lot of really good-looking young defensemen. Um, we have TJ Brody on the roster. We've got uh, Chris Breen. Um, a lot of young guys playing in Abbotsford. Is there any specific advice you would give to a young defenseman trying to crack the NHL? I mean, you've been through that, of being uh, signed as a UFA, playing in the minors, and then making the NHL. Yeah, I mean it's everyone's got their own own game and own own way of uh doing things, but you know, you really just got to be that consistent and, and play well every time and it's it's more of a mental toughness I think than physical a lot of the times. I mean, everyone is so, you know, fast and so good in the NHL. It's kind of the guys that sort of want it more that end up uh, you know, getting that little extra step and going ahead. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, if you look even at the AHL, they're all so good. I mean, it's you know still professional hockey, and only one or two of those guys ever get called up per year. So, yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. The guys who want it the most, the guys who are showing that drive, are the ones that are going to make a long term career yeah, out of it. I mean, hey, it's a it's a really tough career. The you know pro hockey and, and the NHL, and you know you see it, guys. You know, it's hard to stay in that. You know, it's hard to make the league, and then it's hard to stay in the league. You know, unless you're a, a superstar, there's there's so many guys that just come up and down or, you know, have a good couple of years, but then, uh, you know, by the time they're 30, you know, they're not wanted anymore and they're bringing up another young guy. So it's, uh, I mean, that's why it's the best league in the world. It's the most competitive. You've got, you know, the best players in the world and uh, everyone wants to be there. So it's uh, it's cutthroat. A guy like you, you played for the Flames, the Panthers, the Coyotes, the Senators, the Blackhawks, and the Canadians. So you moved around quite a bit. When you're moving around like that, what does it feel like as a player? Does it feel good to know that there's another team that wants you out there? Or is there a lot of kind of hard feelings that you know that there's a team that didn't want you? Well, it was my career. It was, you know, I was in Calgary with Calgary for five years. And so that was a shock. And that kind of hurt when you first get traded. And uh, then I was in Florida for a couple of years, and, you know, I was actually surprised again when I got traded there. But kind of after that, um, you know, I was in situations where the team wasn't going to make the playoffs, and I was an, an older veteran player, and my contract was up. So I, you know, you almost wanted to be traded to go on and make the playoffs. So 
think the, the last two years of my career, I played for four teams. And, you know, when I went from Anaheim to Ottawa. I was really happy and excited. That's what I wanted to do. And then again, when I was in Chicago, you know, we were just uh, not going to make the playoffs. And I, I got the, I was lucky enough to go, uh, go to Montreal. So I was excited for those, those times. Speaking of being traded, um, you mentioned it happens a couple times during your career. What's that process that happens as a player when you get traded? Do you get called off the ice of practice when you're called to the GM's office? Do you know what's going on? Like, does it feel like, you know, okay, the GM wants to talk to me. I know exactly what's going on. Or are you often, you know, sent a text message or a phone call? How does that happen as a player when you're informed you've been traded? Well, I think it's different every time. I think, you know, usually the, the GMs or the coaches like to talk to you and you know face to face and tell you so in Calgary it was right before practice and I was you know we were doing a team stretch and I got called in the coach's office which wasn't that unusual because I was the captain so I you know I had to discuss a few things now and then but then uh, you know they kind of dropped the bomb on you that you got traded and then all of a sudden you're getting a phone call from uh, the general manager of Florida Panthers and he's like yeah we've got a you booked on a flight at three o'clock and at this point it was 10 30 in the morning so, you know, that wow. night you're down in Florida and, and the next morning you're, you know, you, I was actually playing a game and you're, you're meeting all these new players and you're getting the new equipment and it's just, it's a whirlwind. It's, it really does uh, shock the senses when you, when you make a move like that. Yeah, I bet. Especially for that quick, like to be told at 10 in the morning you're traded and then the next day be on the new team. That'd be yeah, tough. Yeah, I mean, that's usually the way it happens. I mean, once the other rights, they want to get you and get you in the lineup and you know, playing, they don't, uh, they don't say here, take three or four days and pack up and settle your affairs. And yeah, it's just boom, you got to go. I mean, there's, there's been cases where guys have gotten traded and those two teams were playing. And I, you know, I've heard, I can't remember who it was, but he, he had to pack up his stuff from one dress room and just walk down the hall, to the other dress room and play. So, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, it was, I had a lot of fun. I enjoyed every minute of being in the NHL and it was, uh, you know, a good career. I'm proud of it, but uh, yeah, I, know I definitely appreciate it. But there are some things that are uh, are difficult to handle, for sure. Outside of your NHL career, you also played for a year for the Hanover Scorpions in the German league. How would you compare the European game or the game in in the league that you were in, the uh, German league, to the NHL? Is it comparable speed wise? Um, do you think that fans of the North American game could watch a European game and still get into it? Nah, it's 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 totally different. I mean, kind of like the Olympics, you're on the big ice. Uh, it's slower. There's not as many hits. And you know, as you can see in the Olympics, it was so defensive. Teams will just sit back. They don't forecheck. Um, they all collapse. So it's to me, it's not a very, as an exciting game. Uh, I had a great time in Germany. It was met a lot of neat people. The culture was was fun. Uh, there's a lot of great players over there. Like there's guys that can skate as fast as guys do in the NHL. There's guys that can shoot as hard as guys in the NHL um they're just sort of missing you know a piece or two here or there they just don't put it all together uh, they don't have quite the same level of, of hockey sense as well but uh you know it was a really good league and you know I had a lot and for of a guy like you you were always very physical in your game so you must have had to find yourself changing your game to adapt to that style then oh for sure yeah and, and that was the thing because he used to really you know punish guys in the corner and you know step up and make the hits and I learned pretty quick over there that, you know, you just, they'd call you for a penalty. Like I, I got a few penalties for hitting too hard and that, you know, it was a clean hit. And I asked the ref later and he's like, Oh, you just, you can't hit that hard. So that was kind of surprising. So yeah, you, you learn just to sort of sit back and, and use your stick and poke check and, and let the play come to you instead of, uh, you know, that all out pace, the NHL, where it's just, you know, everyone's going after each other and it's, it's just so much more exciting. Yeah. Speaking of the physicality, um, one of our listeners who who goes by the handle Flames for Life wants us to ask you a little bit about a fight you had with Ty Domi as a flame on October 6, 1998. As we all know, Domi's quite a heavyweight. Domi's a guy that took a lot of guys down in that fight. And he wanted to know, how did you feel when you squared up to go and uh, drop well, the gloves actually, against Ty Domi? I remember that. I think I fought Ty two or three times. I think I'd fought him once before, but this one, it was our, I believe it was our home opener and it was against the Leafs and we were just getting smoked. Like it was three, nothing early. And you know, your home opener, you want the fans to be excited and everything like that. And it was just draining the life out of the building. And, uh, you know, I, I was trying to, as the captain, I was like, I got to get something going here. We got to change it. So 
at the face off, I said to said to Ty, I said, let's go. Like, which, and I didn't do that very often. It was usually the result of, you know, someone hitting our goalie or a player or something like that. But I just was like, I got to do something. And he said, no, no, I'm not going to fight. And I was like, wow. I, you know, because he was a heavyweight. And... Exactly. I thought Domi took on all comers. Exactly. But he said, no, no, he just wanted to play. And I was like, oh. But then Chris King was on that line. So after the face-off, I went over to him and slashed him. And, and we fought. And, uh, you know, Chris King was a really tough guy, but I, I got a, a lucky punch in there and, and and got him pretty good. So then on the way to the penalty box, uh, Ty skates up to me, you know, the linesman's got me, and he's like, you know, Simpson, you're dead. I'm going to get you. And uh, so I'm sitting in the box. I'm like, okay, well, now now he's going to come and get me because he doesn't feel good about his uh, teammate getting uh, getting kind of beat on. So uh, – by the time I get to the penalty box and I'm on the ice and we're killing a penalty, I think it's four nothing now and we're killing a penalty and I'm I'm I know I'm gonna have to fight Ty, but I'm I'm thinking in my head, well he's never on the power play, so I don't need to worry about him right now. And the next thing I knew he was right in front of me and grabbed me and I he put my jersey over my head and uh so I'm trying to grab his arms and I just I can't see and then I'm trying to pull the jersey over my head, but he pulled it from the front over, so I was actually making it worse by trying to pull it towards the back. He was he was so fast. I didn't know that. So that was one of the more embarrassing times. But uh, I was lucky. He didn't really hit me, so I didn't didn't suffer any damage. But that's good. That was that. <laughs> and when we've gone back and watched the clips, it looks like Ty Domi says something to you right after the fight. Do you remember what he said to you? Oh no, I can't remember. But he was he was one of the better trash. He was one of the better trash talkers out there. He he uh, he liked to tell you how he felt. So and what was going to happen and all the rest of it. But I think he just felt bad because I gave him his chance and he, he said no. And then uh, his teammate got it. So he was, I think he that really fired him up, but I, I did go through the, I went through the proper pecking order. Yeah. That's what you want out of an enforcer though, right? You want the guy who's willing to stand up for his teammate. And... Oh, he was, I mean, Hey, he played what, 16, 17 years. He was one of the best at, at his job and he was great. Todd, what was one, what's your best memory as a member of the Calgary Flames? Is there one one thing that stands out in your head as the best memory you had in your time playing in the Flaming Sea? Well, you know, I, I had a lot of good memories, a lot of, uh, of fun times, a lot of good guys being a part of it in the city. You know, the fans were awesome. Um, you know, I think your first game always stands out because it was my first NHL game. And then uh, my first NHL goal, that was, you know, really special. Um, you know, it was against Detroit and, uh, it was actually probably the nicest goal I scored in my whole career. I'm not sure how I did that, but uh, it was, uh, yeah, that was kind of, you sort of feel like, you know, Hey, you play your first game, you're, you're in the league. And then when you score, it's kind of like you've arrived. So yeah, you've really made probably it. probably the best feeling. Yeah. Cool. Um, our fans always like to hear great road stories or great stories of what goes on kind of behind closed doors. Is there any story that you would share with us of something that happened on the road, happened in the dressing room, something like that? Oh, yeah, those are some of my best memories. We have uh, There's all kinds of fun stories we did. And uh, the group when I was down in, in Florida, there was a bunch of practical jokers there. So you always had to be on, on guard. There was always stuff going on. And, and I think the best, uh, one of the best ones is Mike Sillinger, who was, a great guy, a good friend, uh, hilarious. And he, as a lot of hockey players, he was missing most of his teeth. So he had the whole bridge with, you know, eight or nine teeth on him. He'd, he'd take them out to play the games. So I was coming back from an injury and, uh, I, uh, I wasn't playing. So I, as he went out for the game, we were in Pittsburgh. I already had a, an envelope addressed and, and I had FedEx come to the rink and I, I just grabbed his teeth, dropped him in the FedEx envelope and met the, the driver at the door and they got shipped back to his, uh, his wife back home in Florida. So after the game, he's looking for his teeth and he doesn't know who took them. And he's, you know, then we're on the plane. He's, he's walking up and down the aisle of the plane. He's like, God, all I just want to have is a steak tonight or cob in the corn. He's got everyone laughing and he's asking questions. So then the next morning uh, we were in Ottawa and I, I phone and, and FedEx confirms that it's signed by his wife that he, she's got the teeth. So I know the teeth are safe, but he's, he's on the road without any teeth. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the antics that were going on with everyone, because no one knew who took them, and he thought someone had them on him. But then I knew his wife would have called him right away and said, hey, I've got your teeth. And it, it went on for three or four days uh, going on. And, and finally, Mike and I just ended up just 
laughing our laughing our uh, our heads off at each other because he knew he knew his wife had his teeth back home and and he didn't have them. It was pretty funny. And he ended up finding out it was you that sent them to her. Yeah, it took a, it took a while, but yeah, he figured it out. I I'd actually wrote the return address of another player, so he suspected <laughs> that guy for for a long time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. Good. That's great. Yeah, a lot of those guys have the the bridge. We see that even today. A lot of the guys missing their teeth, and um, you you ended up retiring pretty much your full set of teeth, didn't you? Yeah, I was pretty lucky. Pretty lucky. I, I like to give out the punishment instead of receive it, so I always try to protect my face. Definitely. <laughs> Todd, a lot of our fans, their last memory of you is probably your season on Battle of the Blades in in two thousand eleven, um, where you were a one of the NHL players on that show. Um, that must have been a very interesting experience to be doing that and be, you know, on the skates doing something very different than what you were used to. It was really different, and I'm. Uh, that's good to hear that a lot of the Flames fans are watching, but they, they must have been voting for Kale Hulse and not voting for me, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how it went down. I know a lot of people I talk to <laughs> still remember you as the personality on that season, so... Yeah, I know it was a lot of fun, and, and that figure skating, you know, I don't care what anyone says, that is so hard, it's so difficult, completely different than skating with hockey, and then you're, you know, you're trying to look graceful and lift people, and all And all wear the, the sparkly outfits, and... Well, I was a little disappointed, we didn't get to wear the sparkly outfits, they were trying to make us look, you know, jeans and shirts, and, you know, I wanted to... You know, I wanted to be Chaz Michael Michaels and wear the, the suit that was on fire with all the sparkles and everything, and they just uh, they didn't allow that, so that was a little disappointing. What would you say was your biggest takeaway from that whole Battle of the Blades experience? Well, honestly, I'd say, I'd say it's my new wife, my partner, Marcy Hinsman. She's, we got married, so that was my biggest takeaway. So I feel like I won. I won the whole show. <laughs> there you go. Sometimes that's what it's about, <laughs> right? I mean, you can win in multiple <laughs> different ways. So. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Well, I'm, I'm glad that that worked out for the two of you and uh, that you, you know, I think a lot of hockey fans don't have is a new appreciation for figure skating. Yeah, no, in, in all seriousness, it, it was so difficult. And uh, they're such good skaters. They're way better skaters than us. Their edges, their control. I mean, I wish as a kid I would have taken more of it. I would have been a, a better skater and that would have helped me in the NHL for sure. So maybe that's a thought for the, I know there's a lot of kids and their fathers and coaches that listen to our show. Kids, if you get the chance, go take some figure skating. I, I definitely would agree with that. It's just uh, it's, pro tip it's from awesome. Todd Simpson: get your figure skates. <laughs> That's right. So, Todd, you're uh, you're quite active in the Kelowna community now. Can you tell us a little bit about the Kelowna YMCA Strong for Kids campaign that you're involved with there? Yeah, I got involved with it about six years ago, and it's uh, it's a great program. Uh, helping needy kids in the community, you know, kids that just can't afford to to get involved. Uh, we've got, you know, daycares that help, you know, kids that otherwise would just sort of be left home alone. We get them in uh, leadership programs. Uh, we help help feed a lot of the kids as well. Um, it's just incredible to see the growth of these, you know, these kids that just for whatever different circumstances, you know, no fault of their own, just don't get the opportunities that other kids uh, normally would get. And it's just... Uh, it's a really rewarding experience. I bet it would be, yeah. I've heard of those kind of programs before, and they always really, really sound like they'd be rewarding to work with. Yeah, it's, it's you know, there's all kinds of stories of of kids we've helped, you know, like moms dropping their, their kids off with just, uh, you know, watering down the milk in the in the baby's bottle. You know, so a lot of times the, the two meals we'll give them in the daycare, that's the, you know, you know that's the only two meals they're getting that day. Um, you know, other kids that, that can't swim and we get them in there and they just get the confidence, you know, socially just to be, you know, equal with their peers as well. That's awesome. It's so glad you can, you can get involved with something like that. Yeah. I mean, and I, I learned that with the flames starting out is, is the flames. They always had us involved in, in, uh, in charity and helping out and, and doing different events. And, you know, we we're, you know, we were fortunate enough to be hockey players and just sort of feel like it's a responsibility to, to give back and, and help out the less fortunate. And, of you know, even Brian Burke, who's now president of Hockey Ops here in Calgary, he said that too, as he said, if you're going to be a, wearing a Calgary Flames jersey, you're not only going to be playing hockey, you're going to be a member of this community and a productive member of this community. Yeah, I think that's a, an excellent way to look at it, and, and I think it's a, a good thing to teach 
teach all the young men. Of all the teams you played for, would you say the Calgary Flames had the most kind of community-minded atmosphere for the players? Encouraging them to get out and be part of the community? and Yeah, for sure. It was, uh, you know, we were always doing different events and, and aligning ourselves with different causes and, and helping out, and it was great. Yeah, and, you know, as, as a member of the Calgary community, I love seeing the guys out there. I think it's great. You know, you guys are role models for so many young kids as pro players. So I think it's great every time I see a, a professional hockey player who's out in the community. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a big deal to give back. And, I you know, I think it's part of the responsibility. And, you, you know, you learn a lot about yourself. And, and if you can make uh, other people smile and, and feel good about themselves, it's a, it's a good thing. For sure. And Todd, now in Kelowna, you're actually working as a Royal LePage sales agent, um, selling real estate there. So if there's any Flames fans here in Calgary looking to escape the cold, what should we know about Kelowna real estate? Well, it's uh, fantastic. Like we said, it's, uh, you know, plus five here and minus 30 there. Um, I think a lot of people in Calgary know about the Okanagan Lake. It's just beautiful. we got all the vineyards, golf courses. Uh, it's been a great second career for me. I've been doing it for uh, going on to six years now. Uh, worked with a lot of Calgary buyers, um, always got time for, for more. It's, uh, it's just a, a good market to come into. We've been, uh, been down for the last five years and, uh, we're just starting to level off. So it's a great opportunity. And if somebody was interested in getting into, uh, buying a place in Kelowna, how can they get a hold of you? If you just Google my name, you'll go right to, you'll get my uh, real estate website there and you can give me a phone call or uh, send me an email and uh, we'll get in touch and uh, find out how I can help you best and help your real estate needs. Yeah, your, your website's toddsimpson.ca and Todd's got his phone number on there, his email address. Um, really easy guy to get a hold of. So if anyone's interested in moving to Kelowna, I'm sure Todd would be more than happy to help you out. Yeah, I appreciate that, Dan. That's great. I'd love to help anyone out. No problem. Well, Todd, thanks for sitting down with us today. My pleasure. That was a lot of fun. Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.